the more I work, the more I think I don't know what I'm doing. I have absolutely no idea what am I doing. It's like sweat or shed. It comes out as I go along. As you do one thing over here, something else comes out over there. It's not what you think you're doing. It's like scum on top of things, or like sediment at the bottom. It builds up while you're doing other things. Working feels like trying to face up that what comes out of you. Art is shed. Our galleries are toilets. Curators are toilet attendants. Artists are bullshitters. I feel like a plant or a flower growing stupidly towards the light. As much as you try to control yourself, your body moves. It moves on with you, and your nature gives itself away. You cannot stay still, because being alive, you move. What have I done? I can say that I have moved. What have I made? I can say that I have made movements. To do or to make something, whether a phone call or a painting, is a matter of making a choreographing of movements, of moving your body. I feel bad, and I want to feel better. Wanting makes me feel better. If I take away the things I want, there's a hole where they were. That it, that's why it's better not to get what you want. Emptiness is like a coffee in an American dinner. It has an infinite refill. Good afternoon. My name is Humberto Moro. I'm assistant curator for The Backdoor, uh, the largest survey of Martin Fritz's work ever installed, curated by Tom Eccles and Hansel Bridge Arist. Uh, this is Whatever, a series of talks that we're doing on Saturdays in which we basically ask our guests to present whatever they want accordingly to Martin's disbelief in limits or formats. Uh, today we have the honor of having uh, John Schaefer, who's a New York and uh, WNYC's legend. Uh, um, and he's m probably one of the best interviewer in the world, who's today on the other side of the table. So. Um, I'm very excited to have him here, and we're going to be focusing uh, uh, particularly on Martin's musical production uh, throughout the, the, this series of talks. We, we have had uh, film um, specialists, curators, uh, we're going to have composers, and each one of these talks are happening uh, every Saturday at 3. So um, without any more words, John Schaefer here. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it's interesting to hear you reading some of Martin's words about, you know, how he kind of views art, because he views music and kind of life itself, it seems, the, the, the same way. As it, it's kind of we, the big buzzword in the art world in recent decades has been interactivity, you know, intermediate interactivity. And, you know, what is that? I mean, life is interactive. Um, music is never uh, a passive thing as, as much as, you know, concert halls set it up that way, where a select group of people produce some kind of art and the rest of us sit and passively accept it. That, 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 that actually is an easily subverted way of thinking about music because, you know, it's not enough to sit there. You need to be kind of like receiving and actively kind of processing. And then some of this happens subconsciously whether you want it to or not. But, you know, we, we apply meaning to the sounds that we hear and that act can be a fraught one, you know, if you're faced with a five-hour Wagner opera that has all kinds of subtexts to it, you know, your mind can be, you know, those synapses are firing even as you're perhaps struggling to stay awake. Um, 
with a Martin Creed song, it's just like right there in your face. And the interesting thing about um, the way he views his music, first of all, uh, he has been pursuing a musical career at least as long as he has been quote unquote doing art. Um, he, he started playing the violin as a three-year-old. He is musically literate. He knows how to write music. Although, you know, there's an old joke among jazz players. Can you read music? Yeah, not enough to affect my playing, though. So, so you know, Mar Martin is literate. He chooses very often not to write stuff down um, because he wants that kind of processing happening, that in-the-moment spark of both the creator, him, and the interpreter, the musicians. And then the further spark, in us, the, the listeners. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting to kind of hear him talk about how he does not distinguish, you know, he doesn't, he's, he's kind of genre blind, you know. S some days the creative impulse produces a film, some days it produces a song, some days it produces a stack of cubes, some days it produces a graduated series of cacti, you know, it's all, or a phone call. You know, um, so I had the opportunity to have Martin and his band um, on my program soundcheck during the first week of this exhibit, uh, while he had his band here and was doing shows both here in the Armory and uh, in Brooklyn at National Sawdust. And um, at one point, um, he explained sort of how he started in music and actually why. And maybe maybe we can hear this clip of, from Martin Creed. I've always done it because I, I started doing music because I thought the sculptures I was making were not, if, and I wasn't happy with them. I felt like the thing that people saw was like a bit. Like I was putting all this work into them, and the work was the kind of process I went through. To me, that was the exciting thing about them. And then I ended up with this thing, and then people looked at it. And it was as if they were just seeing a bit left over at the end. You know, it was like, were, it was like the, it was like the work was like the sediment at the bottom of a glass after you had the drink, you know, and I wanted to have me what it was like having a drink. And so I, and then, so I, I got into trying to write music because I thought that in a, in a piece of music you might tell the story, the, the, the basis of the music tells the story of itself being made. So, you know, the, the idea that, that this kind of creative impulse can, can sort of be, you can witness it in the finished piece. That's, that's a really powerful thing in a song when that song is so kind of transparent in its form. And this is maybe something we can talk about as well, is the idea of form in Martin Creed's work is, is something that, well, it's very elastic, you know? Um, and, and there's a lot of subversion of expectation in, in his playing with form, both in terms of what is a sculpture and what is a song. You know, there is a definition in musicological circles of what a song is as a form. It's A, B, A, you know, verse, chorus, verse. Um, but not necessarily in Martin's work. There's also a, a, a neat way in which um, elements of Martin's aesthetic crossover and the way they kind of inform each other. One of the videos that you have either seen already or uh, will be able to see after this is uh, for the song called Thinking Not Thinking. And um, I mean, from the opening moments of the video, you're in the process of the making of it. You see a guy come out and do the slating, you know, and and then you hear the song, and then you see the dogs, who <laughs> are the, the big dog and the little dog. I forget their names, but he uses them. He's used them in multiple times in multiple media. But why don't we take a listen and, and a look at a little bit of the video, um, which is one of the ones sort of off the drill hall. But this is thinking, not thinking. <laughs>
so, so you can see the whole thing as part of the exhibit. But you know, it's tempting with, with something like that to say, OK, when he's thinking, we see the little dog. When he's not thinking, we see the big dog. That's called apophenia. That is your brain attempting to take two disparate sources of, of influence, of, of, you know, of intake, and to kind of weave them together. That's your brain trying to make sense of things that aren't necessarily meant to make sense together. And this, these kinds of juxtapositions are kind of central to um, the, the music that that Martin makes to, to the art that he makes. And it, it's something that he talks about. I mean, he doesn't use fancy lingo like apophenia, but you know, the idea of should something make sense um, came up in our conversation probably three or four times in, in, in various ways. The idea of meaning and what does it mean for art to have meaning? Does it have to have meaning? Or is that our job? Is, is, you know, is that what we're supposed to be doing as the listener slash viewer? And, uh, you know, there's also obviously a, a certain kind of dry, eccentric British wit uh, at, at play in a lot of this stuff as well. Um, and, and a sense of kind of playing with elemental, basic, fundamental things, you know, the, the most simplistic building blocks. So you, you walk into one of the rooms here and you see, you know, a set of empty cartons, you know, forming a kind of pyramid. What, what could be simpler than that? Um, well, what could be simpler than that is counting from one to a hundred. And, you know, that, that is the sole subject of his song, One to a Hundred. And uh, while this also is available downstairs, it might be good to look at a little bit of it. Can you make it a little bit One, two, three. Can you make it a little bit lower so that we hear the, the vocal part? Sure. Okay. Can Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven, thirty eight. I think we know how this goes. <laughs> I, you know, as, as contemporary, yeah, we're just getting to the good part. I mean, as consumers of contemporary art, we begin to think, all right, when does the twist come? There's no twist. He's counting to 100. The fonts change, yes. Yeah. But you keep expecting a chord change, you know, a rhythm, a modulation, something, because it's a quote unquote song. But uh, this sort of goes to what I was saying before. There's no song form here. There's, there's an A, and then that's it. There's no B, there's no bridge, there's no return to A. You've never left A. It's there the whole time. Um, and, you know, it, it, it sort of reminds me of the, the first time I walked through the exhibit. Um, and seeing the way he has intervened in this space, it began to almost like tune the building for me in, in a way that um, I found myself at one point standing in front of the carefully folded fire hose and for a split second thinking, is this part of the exhibit? <laughs> and I realized, no, it's just the fire hose. It's it's the building fire hose. I told him that and he loved this. He loved the idea that y you could kind of make it hard to distinguish where the art ends and the kind of 
life around you begins. So that idea of you know, kind of sub subverting form and you know, setting up an expectation that something is going to happen and then it doesn't happen. You know, that, that, that kind of is, is central to a lot of his, to a lot of his, his work, it seems. Um, it, it, you've probably noticed there's a, a kind of simplicity to his music, an almost kind of childlike quality to it. And um, in terms of putting Martin in a musical context, uh, there's an artist here in, in the States um, who was especially active in the 70s. You might, if, if you ever saw the film Something About Mary, he is all over this film. His name is Jonathan Richman, and, and he has a band called The Modern Lovers. And he would write songs about vegematics and, you know, ice cream trucks and road runners. And it was kind of really simple stuff, and you were left thinking, is this really about a road, is this really about a vegematic? Turns out they were really about these, these things. Um, if you've never heard perhaps his best known song from the early 70s, I want to play a little bit of it for you. It's called Ice Cream Man. And yes, it is about an ice cream man. So, you know, it sounds like a guy who's hosting a kid show, but in fact, this, this was music for kids of a much older age. Um, and, I, you know, I asked Martin whether this kind of music had made it across the pond to the UK, and it had, and he was a big fan. I mean, I, I do like his songs, and, and, and I, I would think of it like that, um, but I just, I find it really difficult to understand things, and then um, I find the world really complicated and difficult, and so keeping it simple, you know, if there's something simple you can do, and uh, that's then, then that, if you can make something that's kind of simple, then you can, that's like something to hang on to. I wish I did. So the idea that writing a song about an ice cream man, you know, is, I mean, that resonated with him. And, um, you know, if you listen to his music, there is this kind of simplicity to it. There's a kind of ramshackle quality to the band. Um, I can tell you from watching them rehearse and sound check that they know what they're doing. Um, and Martin is very kind of concerned with how things are fitting together and how the songs are sort of shaping themselves in, in live performance. But then in the live performance, there's, it's just like, it just happens. And, and it's, not, 